With the ongoing spread of the coronavirus around the world, xenophobia is also on the rise, from loaded hashtags on social media to physical violence on the streets of some major cities. We've seen numerous reports of people of Asian descent, primarily East Asians from China, Japan and South Korea, being accused of carrying the COVID-19 virus and facing discrimination and even assault in both verbal and physical forms. But now xenophobia is also rising against non-Asian ethnicities too, as the disease spreads within continental Europe. To look into this worrying phenomenon, we connect with Dr. Bruce Wiley, Doctor of Medicine and Medical Journalist based in New York. We also have Dr. Diana Ye, Senior Lecturer of Sociology at the City University of London. But we, before we delve into the issue of xenophobia, I'd like to ask you first, Dr. Lee, a brief question about the World Health Organization's decision um, earlier to label the COVID-19 as a global pandemic. First, do you think it was a timely decision, given criticism that it came far too late? And do you think that the outbreak is uh, still manageable, as the organization claims? Yeah, I think the definition of a pandemic, the formal definition is seeing sustained transmission worldwide. And that, that's a very fuzzy definition. Um, but it's, it, it seemed to be more and more inevitable that it would be declared as a pandemic. So the question is, should it have been declared a few days ago or, or a few days later? That's, that's not clear. I mean, the, the actual response doesn't really change, but calling it a pandemic maybe raises the urgency or raises the concern. Um, and in terms of having things under control, well, right now it's, it's clearly spreading in many different countries. So the issue is how much can it be mitigated? So it can no longer be contained. Um, because it's already been transmitting in, in various countries. So how can countries effectively actually mitigate or reduce the impact of the pandemic? Well, as you just said, pandemic really isn't a word that's used lightly, as of course it can incite mm -hmm. panic. And we've of course seen this already happening, which helped give rise to a wave of xenophobia, which really is our main uh, topic of discussion today. Well, Dr. Diana Ye, you've been studying racism and ethnicity for years in the UK, where you highlighted um, invisible discrimination against East Asians. It's become quite conspicuous now. What worries you most about this uh, surge of xenophobia? Um, I think actually what worries me most about this um, wave of xenophobia is the kind of context in which it's emerging. Um, so what I think is that we need to think about it in a wider context than it's currently being um, represented in. I think a lot of the time we're seeing this as something represented as some, a new kind of racist phenomenon. But actually, you know, this has um, very long historical roots. Um, so what worries me most about it is that it's taking place in the rise of um, um, the context of the rise of the far right and populist movements across the US and Europe, which is normalizing racist practice and discourses. Um, so, you know, we have Trump in power in the US here in the UK. We can witness state violence in highly racialized policies such as, you know, immigration, the detention of migrants, anti-terrorism measures such as prevent. So these forms of racial violence are being institutionalized and perpetrated by the state, but this is not being recognized. And instead, what we're doing currently is focusing on um, sort of individual hate crimes of bigoted individuals, rather than looking at the wider climate in which these individuals um, are acting. Right, we are seeing the um, concept of political correctness even starting to diminish, I suppose, uh, speaking in geopolitical terms. And well, Dr. Lee, uh, you have said that this anti-Asian sentiment isn't really anything new in some of your articles. And um, in fact, we saw this uh, racism with SARS in the early 2000s. But what makes this coronavirus outbreak different, bringing out more racist behaviour compared to previous outbreaks like SARS or MERS? Yeah, I think urgent, uh, emergent situations are, or urgent or fear and panic that tends to uncover how people really feel and people's sentiments. So I think the difference between this current pandemic and what happened in 2002 with SARS is this is involving a much larger area, a much larger population. There, so there are people who are, there are more people who are concerned. So when you have that fear, people start dropping the political correctness and they start uh, almost like a reflex moving towards what they instinctually feel. 
So I think we're really actually seeing just a lot of uh, inner feelings come out rather than, you know, people don't sit there and say, oh, a virus is spreading, so maybe I'll change my views of different people. I don't think that's what happens. I think they basically get worried and then they start, you know, they start losing that political correctness and that control. Right. It does seem like people are just responding, perhaps not in the, mo in the best or the most uh, progressive mm -hmm. way. Dr. Ye, while people of East Asian descent are underrepresented in many aspects of mainstream culture, and uh, relatively speaking, most aren't really conf confrontational and uh, some won't speak out as often as perhaps other ethnic groups. Do you think this crisis could become an eye-opener for the Asian community? Um, well, I think many of us are well, very well aware of the kind of racism um, against us. Um, and I think we need to really understand um, the kind of issue about speaking out um, um, a little bit more, because I think what happens is that it's often put down to cultural reasons, that, you know, for reasons of Confucianism or because we're a minority that doesn't like to speak out. We, um, but we need to actually look at the structural issues of not speaking out and think about who has the actual capacity to speak out in particular circumstances. So the people that I've spoken to, they don't want to speak out about the racism because they fear losing their jobs, their businesses and their livelihoods. Um, there are those who can't speak out because of migration status. Um, and if you think about the way in which East and Southeast Asians, particularly the Chinese, entered Britain through the private market, they were not unionized in the same way. And st staying silent has become a kind of necessary strategy for survival. So in, in a sense, um, I don't think this is really an eye-opener, but it is certainly a call to action in that sense. Um, having said that, um, you know, and I can talk a little bit more about the kind of um, organising that's going on, but having said that, I do think it's important to say that the onus should not be on the Asian community, but on government and institutions more widely to protect them. Um, Underrepresentation of East Asians in Britain is very much part of the problem. Um, so um, when when there is um, representation, we are often constructed as foreign. So when um, acting in foreign lands, speaking foreign accents, when actually the Chinese and East and Southeast Asians have been here for centuries, but we're ne never actually seen as part of the social and cultural fabric of Britain. And I think that is um, something that um, perpetuates these kinds of um, violent racist narratives. I see. Well, we had a few hiccups there with the connection, but yes, um, Asians, they have been in the UK, even the US for even centuries, as you said, well, centuries in the UK. and. Um, all this sort of anti-Asian uh, anti sentiment against them. Um, so it's really causing the need to speak out and show, a, show some real facts and uh, put people straight, I suppose, um, about this outbreak. And um, in terms of doing so, uh, Dr. Lee, uh, the role of media, I believe, is very important. Uh, you yourself being a journalist. And actually, mm -hmm. you might know that, uh, you might have heard that a French newspaper actually used a bunch of inflammatory headlines, such as, uh, such as ones including the word yellow and described mm -hmm. the virus as a yellow uh, peril. Do you think mm -hmm. that the uh, media is fueling such racism in a way? And what do you think the media should do to be part of the solution, not the problem? Yeah, certainly headlines like that, uh, yellow peril, or yellow fever, uh, it doesn't benefit anything and it's, it's irresponsible to use such headlines. So there have been some uh, examples of that. And even early on, there are some media headlines that specifically called this the Chinese virus, the Wuhan virus, even though, you know, after 2015, the general convention has been not to name viruses after their origin because you really uh, are the, not origin after the first city that they're seen in or the first location that they're seen in because that simplifies the matter because you know viruses actually travel throughout the world so you don't actually know where it actually originated. So I, I, I do agree that I think the media can do a better job uh, in general at uh, clarifying these issues and making sure that uh, you don't have headlines like that. but. On the flip side, actually calling out some of these issues. So, uh, you know, we've seen this anti East Asian sentiment. So, really making it very clear as a clear statement that this is not, you know, these things are not scientifically accurate. You know, it, it, this virus does not selectively choose a particular type of person to infect. Or, for instance, 
you know, eating Asian food or going to uh, businesses run by East Asians, you're, that's not going to increase your risk of getting the virus. But those are things that are out there. So I think the media can um, do several things. So one is make clear that those are wrong and it's the wrong way to think, but also, um, you know, present more images of East Asian faces or people of East Asian descent in uh, positive lights. So, you know, you don't see that many pictures of people in, you know, romantic comedies or things like that. And then the first time you see is you see them with, with masks on. So I think that leaves an image, a lasting image that is not positive and we need to see more positive images. I totally agree. And it's really up to us as members of society as well to um, really educate ourselves and stand up for those who are being irrationally targeted. Well, that said, uh, there are hashtags such as hashtag I will eat with you trending on social media to support uh, Chinese and Asian restaurants and other things as well. And uh, Dr. Ye, you're actually um, an organiser of this movement. Uh, well, tell us more. Um, how has the reaction been and how can we get involved? OK, yeah, thanks. So um, basically, um, this I Will Eat With You campaign started on um, Leap Year Weekend. And what we wanted to do is really, um, as Dr. Lee said, break through that kind of um, myth that somehow you are at risk if you want to go and eat uh, in an uh, East or Southeast Asian restaurant or be around East or Southeast Asian people. There's absolutely no basis in fact whatsoever. So we wanted to de-racialize the virus in that way by saying, you know, go and support your local businesses. Um, as we've seen, there's been a roughly 50 cent um, slump in um, slump in business because of um, the, the COVID-19. Um, so what we wanted to do is um, to encourage people to go out and all they have to do is go out to their local favorite local takeaway or restaurant and post photos on social media with the hashtags I will eat with you, love Chinatown and hate racism. So it's really about um, building solidarity and fighting back against helping our businesses and showing that we care. And I think we've had some tremendous support up and down the country, um, as well as um, other cities, actually, globally. It's a campaign that started in Australia, but has been picked up in the UK. And um, I think we've kind of like helped it sort of travel to, you know, New York, uh, where Dr. Lee is, um, as well as LA and Singapore and other places. So I really hope that all of your viewers will um, go out and help support this campaign um, by posting pictures and um, tweeting um, with the hashtag I will eat with you. Once again, that's hashtag I will eat with you. And I'm afraid we're out of time. So this is where we will have to uh, wrap up this discussion. But of course, to our viewers, again, if you want to join the movement, you can find it on Twitter, hashtag I will eat with you. As another hashtag goes, Asians are not a virus, but what does spread sickness is irrational pla placement of stigma, fear and hatred that causes division in times where solidarity is needed more than ever. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Bruce Wiley and Dr. Diana Ye, joining us all the way from New York and London. Thank you. Happy to be here. This is also where we wrap up our show. Thank you for watching. Join us at the same time tomorrow with more global insights on issues making headlines. Goodbye.